Gentlemen, it's the time for the last talk of this uh, this Saturday here at Kiwi PyCon here in Christchurch. And uh, if you're looking for Lee Begg's talk, that was uh, 45 minutes ago in the other room. Uh, we have a different Lee for you in this room this afternoon. Uh, Lee Symes works at Catalyst IT, working on all manner of languages, and today is going to be telling us about Python and why it is fantastic, and perhaps why some other languages might be good as well. Uh, please make her welcome. Um, yeah, hi. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about basically why I absolutely love Python and um, I mean, and some of the bugbears and some of the other languages that I code in from time to time that I also really like. So um, a little bit of background about me. Um, I studied a uh, Bachelor of I study Information Technology and Mathematics at the University of Queensland in Brisbane. Um, and uh, whilst I was there, I did a lot of Java. I also dabbled in a couple of other languages, Python, C, a little bit of JavaScript. Um, then, at the beginning of this year, I got offered a job at Catalyst and jumped the ditch. And I'm now working um, in Auckland for Catalyst, doing Python, JavaScript, PHP, occasionally dabbling in Perl, which is interesting. Um, so yeah, my talk today, basically, uh, it's kind of five somewhat interconnected sections. Um, so I'm going to sort of start off and talk about why I really don't like jumping between languages. Um, just mm -hmm. some of the really irritating things about going from PHP to Python and back again. And then I'm going to go on to async and just talk about basically what I love about Python's asynchronous, the various things you can do in, with async. Um, then I'll go on to the pain point of packaging and then on to unit testing and finally I'm going to talk about why I love Python just because that's what this talk is about apparently. Um, so yeah, um, basically my, I move between PHP and Python and JavaScript, and it's always a pain remembering, oh, I, I need to put a semicolon there, or do I need to put curly brackets or not? Is it a colon and an indent? And just so many things are different, and oh, the quotes that get me every time. But I, I yeah, I, I just find it so frustrating moving between the so many different languages that I end up having to do on my job. Um, and then there's spacing, which, I mean, we've got PEP8 and Python, and there's a couple of different standards, but like, do I use two spaces, or is it four spaces for this project? And you know, what, how, how do I space my functions? And uh, <coughs> it's complicated, and trying to remember which one I'm meant to use is always fun. So, um, and then we get naming conventions. And um, Python doesn't. Well, Python, Python's Python. It, um, it uses all three, the just one long word, and then camel case, and then snake case. And you know, that's fine. You have to look it up in the documentation. And you know, is this the library that uses the camel case one, or is it the underscores? It's so difficult to remember. But luckily, the documentation for Python is really great. Um, Java's better. It's very rigid and structured. You, you will do it one way, but it's good and it's bad at the same time. And then just general functions, like do I, do I push to a list or is that append? What about do I add? Is that, which, which function do I use? Oh, I'll check the documentation. And you know, is it a while true or is it a do while? And you know, do I do, I do a for loop or is it a for each or a for in? Or, uh, so many different ways of looping over a list. <laughs> um, but at least it only has one import statement, right? Um, and, it, and it does do namespaces, which Node does, JavaScript doesn't, and PHP might, <laughs> um, apparently. Um, so yeah, that's me. <laughs> Basically, doesn't really segue, but my next topic is asynchronous. Um, so I'm going to just I don't know, talk about what async is. Async is basically you 
you usually write a script and it goes through and does one thing after the other. That's slow and, you know, kind of boring. And so you put it into multiple threads, except in Python, which has the global interpreter lock, which makes it all fun and exciting. Um, but you, you want to do multiple things at once, but you always run into problems and, oh, that list and uh, locking and everything's so horrible. So um, threading is basically you, you have multiple threads of execution and you do them at the same time. Um, but the problem with threading is obviously if you're if you're trying to, say, add an element to a list, you've got to make sure that you don't have two threads trying to do that at the same time. Otherwise, you either end up with two elements added to the list, one element added to the list, or some kind of explosion that may or may not cause damage. Um, which, you know, it's, it has its benefits, but you've got to know what you're doing with threading. Um, you know, so the next option, really, is multiprocessing. Um, Python does this really well with the multiprocessing library, but you know, sharing data is kind of hard. You've got to do it, a lot of it yourself. You you can't you can't make things sort of interact easily. Um, but then again, if you don't need that, then multiprocessing is great. Um, but and then the final one is AsyncIO. I absolutely love AsyncIO. Um, I came from Twisted and found AsyncIO in Python three. Four, three, three, and it is the most amazing thing from from my point of view. Um, basically, what it allows you to do is it allows you to write purely synchronous code. It all runs in the same thread, so you don't have to worry about locking or unlocking and making sure you you know sharing data and everything else like that. It's all you know. It doesn't it doesn't even need to be worried about. Um, but the the really cool thing is, if you say hit a website, if you ask for information off a website, what will happen is it will basically, instead of blocking the entire program, it will kind of do some magic that means that you can run other bits of code somewhere else. And then when that website gets back to you, it will basically start running as though your function, as though it was purely synchronous. But in the background, a whole lot of other stuff's happened. And it means that you can write relatively easy to understand code that runs faster than just pure do this, do that, then that. But you know, it, it runs faster, and you don't have to worry about, oh, am I locking this? Or have I, have I got to think about how I'm communicating? Or what if I share this data? And, uh, so that's. That's why I really like it, because it just makes that so much easier to work with. Um, so um, this is kind of where I segue into dealing with packaging. Um, I don't know. Packaging in Python is complicated. Um, I mean, pip tends to just pollute your system, and you've got virtual environment, virtual env and vnv, whichever one you're meant to use. And one of them is supposed to come with Python, except from Ubuntu. And it's, it, it's horrible, because uh, I, I don't like it, <laughs> but I'm working in Python, so I'm stuck with it. Um, uh, admission, I've never actually built a self.py. I've never built a package for Python. I've really only worked with packages as a user of them. But uh, at the same time, it's kind of painful in that way as well. So. Um, at least it isn't Java. There, there is no package manager for Java. You, you, want to, you want to try and, like, you have a library, but it has dependencies, well, good luck. Um, let your build system take care of it. That's totally the way to go, um, which is kind of not a good way to go. Um, but my, my go-to awesome packaging is, uh, is no, sorry and Node Package Manager. Um, I really like it. It does everything local first. So if you go, pip, uh, sorry, if you go Node in npm install, it doesn't go into your system. It sits in a directory. And it, it just, it doesn't pollute your system by default. And it means that 
Um, and because of that, and because it's really well integrated into the whole Node.js envi um, environment, it kind of just works. Um, the other thing I really like about the whole Node.js ecosystem is that you will you start with a package. The, the first thing you do when you're writing a node, um, when you start a node project, is not write some lines of code. It's run npm in it. You build your package file, and all of a sudden, you know, five minutes later, after ask, answering a couple of simple questions, you've got a package. And then you can go and code. And it's not, it's not a big problem. It's not, it's not frustrating. It's just easy. And that is something that I think Python sh could learn a lot from, just make it easier to package. So what do I think Python could do about this? Well, maybe make it easy to create setup.py. You know, a lot of Python packages are going to use the same sort of thing. You know, it's just Python files. We just want to install them. So maybe write pip in it. And then well, I need to install a package because my program depends on it. So why don't we just add something that saves it into the setup.py when you, when you run pip so that you don't have to go and edit requirements.txt or something else that just makes it a bit more complicated. And then allow your setup.py to install those packages in your local system so that, you, so that a new developer can come in and go, oh, OK. I've just downloaded this project from Git. I need all the dependencies. Well, I'll just go setup.py space install. Ah, cool. Now I've got all the dependencies. Let's go and do some awesome stuff. Um, and the other thing is just introduce it earlier. I, I think that the, the way Node handles it is really good because it means that even if you write, even if your package is 15 lines of code, it's it's really easy to write a package, um, put it on the, the node repository, and have other people use it. I mean, my first package for node was 30 odd lines of code that you know, did something really simple. And people are using it because it's just easy to throw another package in. You know, I don't need to bake my own stuff because someone else has baked it. And I'm just going to grab it off the shelf and put it in with all this other stuff. And it doesn't, it doesn't, um, gosh, I've lost my place. It, it doesn't matter that you're adding another dependency because it's easy to handle. It doesn't impact it. Um, so as part of packaging, you obviously want to write unit tests, right? Um, so what sort of unit testing stuff do we have? Um, I'm very fond of the way um, Mocha, which is a unit testing library in Node, um, writes and writes the unit tests. Um, so I don't know how well that, that really didn't turn out very well, did it? Ah, well, that's a shame. So basically, um, in Java, you write it the same way that you write it in Python. You know, they're incredibly similar. Um, and then using um, in JavaScript, you basically you say, I want to describe this thing. And you can put sub things like, I'm describing something. I'm describing foo, which is part of something. And I'm saying that foo should return bar. Um, and then when you output it, it outputs it as um, something, foo, should return bar. And it's really it's easy to read, it's easy to write, and it's easy to see that where the failures are in those tests. Um, Again, Python versus Java is very similar. I'm, it's very, very easy to see. You know, the, well, they're probably written from the same chunk of code and just ported. But then you have um, the JavaScript asserts, which are very business driven, or what is it? Business driven development, business driven testing. I don't know what's the technical term for that. Um, but basically, you say, Something should equal 50. So 100 divided by 2 should equal 50. Or you know, some string should exist. Um, and that, 
I, I really like that because it makes it really clear what you're trying to say, um, which is nice. Um, and then we get the final thing, which is kind of where I want to do dynamic stuff. Like, if I'm testing my command line utility, the command line utility will take a short opt and a long opt. And I want to take tests that both of them work, but I can't, I don't want to just copy and paste the entire chunk of code that does the test and, re and just replace that single character, you know, the single string with, you know, the the short op versus the long one. So I will put it in a for loop, or in the case of JavaScript, for each. Um, but in Java, that's really quite complicated, and it requires external libraries and blah. So and then mocking is just interesting. Um, I, I've tried mocking in Java. It's not the nicest experience. Um, I've tried mocking in Python. It's much nicer just because, um, well, just because it's nicer. <laughs> it's Python. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really, it's not, um, I don't know, mocking's just uh, complicated and yeah. So, um, <coughs> Wow. Um, so yeah, and then the final thing I guess I really want to talk about is just why I absolutely love Python. Um, the magic, the magic that keeps me coming back apart from work. Um, so um, this, yeah, so generators, um, they're really, really cool. If you haven't played with them, I totally suggest it. But um, you can do things like, um, it's really, really simple to do, but you, the results you can get are really quite complicated. Um, with the new yield from, which I believe was added, it was added in um, one of the Python 3 versions. I don't remember the exact one. But um, basically what you can do is you can say, I'm going to be a generator, but I want to basically loop over everything in this generator as well. So you can write the itatools.chain just by using yield from, instead of having to, well, you probably want to use the itatools.chain, but you can write it with yield from if you wanted to. Um, and you know, JavaScript also has um, iterators, um, but they're a little bit more finicky because you've got to use this um, of, for of, rather than just treating it like a list. Um, but that's only in ES6 which is hopefully supported by some browsers. And um, in I don't know, IE8 maybe? <laughs> um, and just so you're aware, don't try and run the JavaScript one. Um, I tried it, and I had to kill Firefox. Um, because infinite loops are fun. Um, <laughs> so decorators, um, they're really great if you just want to pull stuff, like a lot of uh, boilerplate code, like, oh, I need to check whether someone's authenticated. Oh, we'll just create a decorator and go at requires authentication, and we'll just throw an error when they're not authenticated. And they're really, really cool. They're really easy to use, but boy, is writing them such a pain. They just, oh, so much boilerplate. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, ah. Um, You'll see me use decorators in a bit because I'm going to talk about context managers, which are my little baby. I'm I'm really 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 fond of writing context managers now. Um, just so you aren't aware, um, the top one's Python, in case, and the bottom one's Java, and they do the same thing, which is open a file, write hello world to it, well or something, and uh, close it again safely. Um, which, yeah, that's um, it's quite a bit of code for doing that. Um, but like the the whole context manager thing just makes it so much easier to do. Um, and then there's a really cool library called ContextLib, which allows you to do cool stuff like writing your own context managers without having to know all the under under enter and the under exit and all that stuff. You can just use um, an iterator and a decorator 
to basically create a context manager. So what will happen in here is we'll say, um, in, we'll run the try and then we'll, when we hit the yield, it will run whatever's in the width block. And once that's, so it, in this case, it will throw an error, which will again get caught in the exception block and then we'll exit with an exit code of one. Um, which is really cool because that's somewhat easy to read and it actually works, which is nice. Um, so that, I really, really like that and I can't, I, I can't say how much I like it <laughs> enough. Um, so, um, cool things, monkey patching. Did you know you can put an if statement in your class definition? Why? Well, yeah, you and your code. Great. Um, yeah, I, I didn't know you could do that until I saw it in a library and thought, why would you want to? Okay, it's Python. That's why you'd want to do it. Um, yeah, you can do cool stuff like that and just go, oh, I don't need that function. We'll just assign it to an empty lambda. Cool. It's dealt with. We don't need to worry about that function being called anymore. Um, so, and then ABCs, which are abstract-based classes. Um, basically, what they allow you to do is create, a di say, a dictionary or a list or a set or a whole heap of cool collection type things at the moment. Um, but basically, what you can do is you implement like three methods, and you've got a dictionary with all the clear and um, you know it items. Uh, values, keys, everything, and you haven't had to implement that. Obviously, it's not going to be the best implementation because, well, you, it's going to be a dumb implementation, but at the same time, it's actually going to be a implementation that works, which makes developing this sort of thing really fast and clean because you can just go, oh, yeah, I just implemented those three methods and all of a sudden it's a dictionary. I don't need to worry about writing a whole heap of boilerplate that basically does whatever this ABC does um, to make a dictionary. Um, and I, I promise this is the last thing, okay? <laughs> I'm not going to get in the way of your alcohol or not alcohol. Um, so. And I, the final thing, I guess, done does I being able to write something plus something else without having to do a whole heap of crazy stuff is really, 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 really cool. Coming from Java, where in order to do a big integer plus another big integer, you, you end up writing this big integer dot add this other big integer and then you want to assign something because of the way Java works or the way big integer classes work. And then if you want to do comparisons, it's complicated, but with Python, it's, oh yeah, you just implement those methods and all of a sudden you don't even have to think about the fact that they're different classes. They just work, which is really, really nice. Um, so, that's my talk. Thank you all for listening and not throwing stuff. <laughs>
Hey, uh, I haven't heard of uh, mocking uh, other oh. than mocking the language or something. Um, but so we do that a lot to Java. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell? Um, so basically what mocking does, uh, it's usually used in testing. So if we're, say, testing um, I don't know, credit card transactions, right? So there'll be, you'll have like a, a layer that sits between a credit card provider, say, and your actual API. So what you'll do is you'll be testing this layer, and you want to make sure that it gets, it calls the actual credit card provider correctly, but you don't want to be calling the credit card provider because that's going to cost you money. Um, so what you'll do is you basically put um, what they call a mock, which is sort of like, um, it's a fake object. And what will happen is it will call that, and you can say, oh, when you get this argument, return true. And then in your test code, you can say, was this function called? Yes, it was. OK, great. So we're calling the credit card provider correctly. So as long as the credit card provider is doing everything right, we know our code is going to work, um, which is basically what mocking does. OK, we have a question over here. Hi, I have a question. That was a really good talk. I have no question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <sighs> Sigh. <laughs> oh, um, uh, Grant. Hey. Hi, yeah, great talk. Um, I also agree with this tutorials and setup tools and all those other packaging things. I think that they're way more painful than they need to be. But I found this really cool package on uh, on uh, PyPy, PYPI, yep. not the not the other PyPy, um, called Cookie Cutter. I don't know if anyone else here has heard about it. It's a great tool. If you're just starting a new project, you can use this to to give you like a skeleton for your uh, your, your documentation and Sphinx and your tests and and your packaging with your setup.py. Okay. It's, I it's really, really powerful. So cool. Yeah, I haven't worth heard of it, at. but I will look at that yeah, okay. once I become connected. Ooh, oh, we so we've got, a oh, we've got a few more questions. Got a cacophony of questions. I'll start over here. Uh, I noticed that in one of your slides you mentioned the problem with packaging. I know nothing about Java, not much about Java and Node.js, but I would like to say something about Python. Uh, if you want to install packages through pip for different projects with different versions without polluting your system, without using virtual env, what you can do is you can create one folder for each of your project and compile Python and make an install installation for each of these projects. <laughs> then you use the Python interpreter for that project to, you know, to, to run pip so that you can just install the packages you want for your for that project without polluting each other. Thank that, you. That's a novel solution. I, I <laughs> quite like that. Uh, OK, so we've got a couple more questions, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, so I'm it's mostly a question. <laughs> uh, I can phrase it as a question, but that won't help. So um, pip init, pip install pip init, and that does a lot of what you want. Oh, OK. And cool. there's some other stuff I'd like to talk with you offline about. Awesome. And we'll make this the last question. Uh, one question and one quick point. Uh, Java 8.7 has the contact, contact manager kind of things. Yes. It has try with resources. Yes. Um, and my question was, what is it about writing decorators you find so obnoxious? <laughs> um, I've never I'm found them that obnoxious myself. Out of all the things that could be obnoxious in <laughs> Python, decorators <laughs> is not one thing that comes to mind. No, I just don't like having to, uh, like, I don't write them enough to be able to just hit the keyboard and produce a decorator. So I have to look it up. And it just doesn't seem nice. Like a lot of Python stuff's really nice. Like the, the context managers are really nice. But decor writing decorators, you've got to define a wrapped function. They've got to check whether you're being called with one argument that's a call that's the function itself, or you've got to return or you've got to do some other stuff that makes it work. I mean, there's, there's the things with, um, if you're being called, if you decorate and then you put arguments in. Yeah, that's, that's kind of the pain point for me is, you know, I, I need, do I need to check whether I'm getting arguments or not? Is it, 
if it's got arguments, does it optionally have arguments? And there's just a whole heap of really not quite nice stuff. I mean, yeah, there's not much you can do about it, but there's not much. Uh, I still not very fond of it. So, um, questions. I I just like to thank Grant at the back there just for pushing me over the cliff of doing this talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and that's all the time we have. Thanks to you, Lou. And.